Good day, everyone. We're now at the top of the hour. The session is being recorded, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Understanding the Biological Machinery by Cryogenic TEM Imaging and Structure Determination. I'm your host, Mike Lasecki. This webinar is presented by NCI Southwest and the NAC Network. This webinar is hosted by ATE Central. ATE Central acts as an information hub for the National Science Foundation's ATE grantee community. You can see all about ATE Central and their whole series of webinars at atecentral.net slash webinars. It's my pleasure today to welcome our moderator. And there you see myself on the lower right. I'm Mike Lasecki. I'm the co-PI at the NAC Support Center. Joining us today is Trevor Thornton from Arizona State University. Trevor is the director of the National Nanotechnology Center and a professor of electrical engineering at ASU. Welcome, Trevor. I'd like to uh, change to the next slide and have you introduce your presenter colleagues today. Well, thank you, Mike. I'm sitting here with Dwight Williams and Katya March. Uh, welcome to both of you. They, they are both research scientists here at ASU, experts in all kinds of different forms of electron microscopy. And I must say, I've been looking forward to this webinar for, for, for some time now, ever since I heard on the radio that the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was awarded to the developers of this instrument. So Dwight, that's quite an achievement, isn't it? It is. Um, there's been a long time coming. A lot of technological advances in the last decade have really kind of propelled us to that position. You know, we came from a world where a lot of people discounted us as blobologists, and uh, we're now moving towards more structural information that is more accepted within the community at atomic resolution. Yeah, and it's a pleasure to be there with you and to be there with my colleagues to help you to ask some questions and to discover what is the trail here. So, Dwight, I'll hand you over control of the slides now with the cursor. Okay, well, let's get started. So this is uh, the three recipients of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry this past year. So that's Jacques de Boucher. He's responsible for figuring out how to vitrify biological specimens so that we can look at them in the electron microscope. Um, Joachim Frank, who is uh, really a person who draw, drove most of the uh, image processing technology forward and been a mentor to a large number of the people who are really pushing the field forward. And then Richard Henderson, who's just an all-around brilliant man who's done a lot of the physics on camera development as well as microscope development and methodology for doing the image processing. So if we think about biology, we, we really have to think about how things are constructed. And almost all biological molecules are constructed from a single sort of subunit, in the case of DNA, a nucleic acid that then polymerizes into what we think of as deoxyribonucleic acid. And then that's further assembled into what we know as chromatin, and then into chromosomes when we go through mitosis or meiosis. And so if we think about all biological molecules, they're really just an assembly state of single smaller subunits that assemble into a larger assembly state, such as the lipid membrane, and also proteins which start out with amino acids that go get folded into um, helices and beta sheets, and then they form the um, quaternary structure that we know of as proteins. So we think about biomolecular fold space. It's something we have to understand is there's only so many conformations these biomolecules can undertake and still be functional in the biological world. And traditionally, we studied these structures by either X-ray crystallography or NMR spectroscopy. So X-ray crystallography captures a single state because it depends on the crystallization process in order to get the structural information. And the crystallization is really a final purification method that selects a single state of the molecule from solution to form the crystal. And if it didn't do that, it wouldn't form a well-formed crystal that would diffract well. Now, NMR spectroscopy can look at um, dynamic states, but it's really limited in the size because of the need to separate the different peaks needed to um, solve the structure. So the magnets can only get so big. And so we're limited to maybe 40 kilodaltons for NMR spectroscopy. But in the past 20 years, we've had a large number of private and public structure determination consortiums formed. And we now have 150,000 protein structures 
in the database, so the PDB is what we call that, protein database, and we're now adding 15,000 per year. And a large proportion of those are now coming from cryo-EM. And so it's believed that we'll soon solve the protein fold and DNA fold patterns, and it really will be a computational problem more than it will be a structural problem. This is amazing, Dwight. This sounds like in the past, we haven't been able to image these proteins in their real state and see what they really look like. But now you're, they're doing this 15,000 times a year. And so that's the big question right now. So having solved most of the structures by crystallography, I think there's a lot of people who want to go back and see what the proteins look like in solution in, more, a, di in a more dynamic state where they're undergoing catalysis or interacting with binding partners. And so that's one of the real exciting things about cryo-EM is we're looking at the molecules in essentially the native state in solution. I mean, crystals are in solution, but they're, they're packed into a state that is unnatural. And so really, when we think about it, we're, we're determining the structure of higher order assemblies. And what we really want to do is begin to build this up into the assembly state of the cell, organelle, and tissues, and really understand how the biological machine works. I mean, one of the easy ways to, to think about it is we can look at a spark plug in a motor and try to deduce how a motor works by the spark plug, but there's so many other moving pieces to a, an engine that just knowing how a spark plug looks like and how it works doesn't really tell us how an engine works. Yeah, that's a nice yeah. analogy. That's a good one. So EN imaging is really well suited for this, and the reason is because we can image from organisms all the way down to atoms. And so in biological terms, we don't really see atoms. We can see the proteins very easily. But we have methods that allow us to average many, many, many things that look very similar together, and that gives us near atomic resolution of these um, complexes. So you mean that it's not necessary to have an aberration corrector, for example? No. And so Koch is an expert in aberration corrector microscopy and spectroscopy of elements. And so they look at atoms routinely in non-biological materials. And the reason they can do that is because the molecules are conductive, and they withstand large electron doses. Biological molecules do not withstand large amounts of electrons. We know that because if we get struck by lightning, we don't survive that very well, whereas the metal pole next to you does just fine. Yeah, you're right. Oh, we have a question, uh, Dwight. Uh, this approach can be used for non-biological samples, liquid-solid interface, for example? Absolutely. I mean, there is now a large push for um, people who are making nanoparticles that are, say, coded in biological or sort of organics um, that want to know sort of like how their molecules are arranged in three-dimensional space. So I did a lot of that work both here and at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you. So why cryo-EM? Well, all the biological chemistry occurs in water. Um, life doesn't exist outside of water, so we really want to know how these enzymes and these molecules are behaving in water. And in fact, Lipid organization doesn't exist without water. Biological, require, biological molecules require the water, but they're not compatible with the high vacuum of the electron microscope. So the electron microscope operate under ultra-high vacuum. So water would immediately um, evaporate or turn to ice in the microscope. Um, so the best solution to looking at molecules in water is to make the water ice. But we don't want to form ice because ice expands. That would destroy the molecule. So we want to freeze the water in what's called vitreous state or water state or glass state. And so that was the work of Jacques Debuchet, and that's why he won the Nobel Prize um, last year. And so how do we do this? Um, so we want to have it as near native as possible. So we need to freeze it very quickly so the water doesn't transition to a cubic or hexagonal ice pattern, which would expand and destroy the biological molecule. So we can plunge this into liquid nitrogen or cooled ethane, but that will only freeze up to about 5 micrometers um, vitreously. Um, if we want to go for larger, thicker volumes, we have to use a high-pressure freezer to get up to about 500 micrometers. So, so why this, this is very different to your average chest freezer in your kitchen at home, right? What are we looking at here? Yeah, so when we freeze an ethane, we're cooling the ethane with liquid nitrogen. And the ethane, which is normally a gas, forms a liquid. And so the, the reason we use ethane is because it has a high specific heat activity. What that means is it takes a lot of energy to convert it from a, a liquid state to a gas state, whereas liquid nitrogen doesn't freeze very well because you can stick your finger in it, 
And the reason you can do that is because it turns to a gas state very easily, and that gas forms an insulating layer around your finger. Um, ethane will not do that. Um, in the high pressure freezer, we go up to 5,000 psi, and we blast it at the material it, from both directions and create a high pressure freezing environment. Uh, we have a concern from one uh, uh, participant. Uh, does the cryo process disintegrate the biological molecules? And there is some discussion with the natural uh, state. We try not to dehydrate the biological molecules. Um, when we plunge freeze, what we do is we are um, blotting away the liquid, and that's our next slide. So we blot the material onto a fenestrated carbon film or a holy carbon film. And so if you look at this slide here, you can see there's tiny little holes in the carbon surface. They form what's called a window, which we hope the biological molecules reside in. Um, we'll apply to that about five microliters of um, liquid, see if this will come up here, onto that holy carbon film. There we go. And so we do that with a pipette. And then we blot away as much of the liquid as possible to get a thin distal film. And the hope is that the molecules all reside within the liquid uh, layer in the carbon holes. And we should be able to image that molecule in the ice. And in theory, the water should be as thick as the molecule. Um, and in many cases, such as when we look at viruses or small protein molecules, you'll see regions that exclude the molecule because it's too thin. So the hope is that we don't distort the biological molecules. But there are times where you have hydrophobic patches that will um, move to the air-water interface and sometimes can denature the molecule. And so these are the sort of things we have to work with and sort out when we're trying to get our favorite molecule into ice. And so it's not just as simple as throwing a bunch of protein onto a grid and blotting it away. There's a lot of biophysical parameters we have to think about and ways that we need to stabilize our molecules. I can see why this is key to the whole process, right? Because if I just freeze water in my ice tray at home, yeah. it cracks and everything changes shape. Exactly. Yeah. It's a big advantage of uh, Jack Debauchet did uh, during uh, this uh, process and this uh, uh, method. Well, he worked out um, really a lot of different methods, how to um, cryosection as well as um, doing the plunge freeze process. Mm -hmm. I mean, until he came along, no one really ever tried this. And it was really the technological difficulty of putting something frozen into an electron microscope was um, horrifying to most people. <laughs> yes. And we used to embed most things into plastics or dry them onto the surface of carbon support and surround them with a heavy metal. The problem with that is that the diffraction of the electrons in those cases was not driven by the biological molecules, but by heavy atoms. And so we couldn't get to the very high resolution information that composes mm -hmm. the biological material. We couldn't see the helices. We couldn't see the amino acids. So we couldn't really understand the chemistry of the folding. Thank you. So the biggest thing about TEM images is that they're a projection. And I love this cartoon from The New Yorker because it shows a rabbit that now has a projection image that looks like a hand. And that's the problem with what we're doing is that we really don't know three-dimensionally at the beginning what our molecules look like. And so we have to be very careful that we don't reconstruct a hand from the projection of a rabbit. Nice picture. Exactly. I like that one, yes. And so there's a lot of ways to go about creating um, 3D structures from 2D projections. So the easiest one for most people to understand, because they've undergone this process in a hospital or seen a, a loved one or a relative undergo this process, and that's a CAT scan. And you lay on a table, and the um, source of the radiation orbits around you, creating a three-dimensional picture of your body. And that will help the surgeon then to localize the regions he needs to go in and do surgery upon. Um, for the um, biological material in the electron microscope, we have two options. We can't rotate an electron microscope because they don't do well in rotation. So instead of rotating the biological or the microscope, we'll rotate the biological material relative to the electron beam. It seems better to do that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but there's a problem with that, and that's eventually the table the biological material sets on, we call that the electron um, grid, electron microscope grid, um, gets in the way. So we can only tilt so far, usually plus or minus 70 to 80 degrees. Um, in addition, the, the path length of the electron beam becomes greater and greater as we tilt. And so the information that we get out of the um, material 
begins to get less and less. Now, in single particle methods, we actually depend on the molecules themselves to be randomly orientated in the ice. And so we'll get thousands of thousands of different views of the molecule as they um, tumble through the water. So why would we do the different methods? So electron tomography is really for looking at unique structures. So if we wanted to look at a mitochondria, no two mitochondria look alike, so we can't average the mitochondria together. So we'll do a, tom a tomogram of the mitochondria. But if we are looking at the ATP synthase, or synthetase, in the mitochondrial membrane, we would want to do single particle methods. So now, Dwight, I'm not a biologist, so the mitochondria, those are what, the power cells in the nucleus? Yeah, and so those are the places where we create all our ATP, which is the molecule that creates power for life. And so we use the ATP to move our muscles and um, to blink our eyes and allow us to sweat water out of our yeah. pores and all these things. And so the ATP synthase is the mo molecule that sits in the membrane and uses the uh, proton gradient that the mitochondria develops to make ATP as it collapses that proton gradient. So all fundamental to life then. Yeah. And so here's the beginning to understand the single particle reconstruction. So we have our material in ice with the electron beam creating a projection image. And so we have to solve for a number of factors. So the first thing is we have to solve for how much dose we can put through our specimen. Because if we image our material, we don't want to burn it into a, a smudgy blob. We want to actually see what it looks like. And so over the years, we've determined that we can put about 10 to 30 electrons per angstrom squared through biological material and still preserve the information that we're interested in. The next thing we need to know is the x and y position of each molecule relative to each other. So we have to find the registration of each molecule relative to each other, plus the Euler angles, which are alpha, beta, gamma, which is the rotational relationship of each molecule to each other. And that's the picture you're showing down here, is that yeah. right? Yes, here we go. And so the last thing we need to know is the magnification, any signation that may occur in the instrument due to lens aberration, and the defocus. So we use defocus typically in the electron microscope, which is very different from what Katja would do on uh, yeah. hard materials, in order to induce contrast. Because if we think about biological materials, they're mostly made of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And they're in a solution of just oxygen. And so the atomic composition of the two materials is not too different. So we think about water, it has a density of about 1. The density of biological materials is between 1.16 and 1.21. And very close. so very close. So we actually use defocus to induce the contrast so we can see the molecules in the water. That is so odd, isn't it? Because everybody, all the microscopes I've ever used, you want to have the best possible focus, and now here you'll yeah, defocus. So you want to work at what's called Scherzer focus, which will be where there's no Fourier um, or inversion due to the contrast transfer function. And so that's basically inducing contrast by making your image bad. <laughs> now, what we do is we mathematically solve for that convolution. Um, if you're a material scientist, you don't need to do that. You can just simply work at focus and see the individual atoms. We can't do that because by the time we see the atoms, everything would be turned into ionized material. So water becomes superoxide radicals and hydrogen molecule, um, uh, gas, and then you know, a bubble will pop, and then everything will get broken down into the elemental. It won't be a biological material anymore. It will be yeah. carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. So here's single particle reconstruction overview. We take all our images and we window them out of the larger image so that we have basically a bunch of individual particle images that are all presumably in different orientations. You can see they have low contrast. And then we're going to align them translationally in X and Y and rotationally and hopefully get all the different views matched up and then sum those images together and get higher signal to noise. So if you think about the original image has very little signal versus the noise from the camera. And then we do this, and we call this classification. And we've got a higher amount of signal versus the noise. And now we can use a method called common line that will basically figure out the, the orientation of each of these molecules relative to one another. And so now we've got an angular and translational assignment for each of these classes. And we do a 
a back projection of these molecules to create a three-dimensional structure. But once we get the three-dimensional structure, there's no reason to do this again. Now we can project this three-dimensional structure out in known angles and then match them to the particles. And we can iterate this over and over and over again, improving the angular relationship of each of the molecules and making it finer and finer and finer and pushing it to higher and higher resolution. And this is the method that we use to solve um, structure of biological molecules by single particle reconstruction. Uh, how many images do you need to, to, to do that? Typically, we need hundreds of thousands. Um, to get to atomic resolution in the old days, we needed about 1.6 million. Nowadays, we're using about 100,000 molecules to get to atomic resolution. So we've gotten a great improvement. I'm going to talk about some of that technology later in the talk. Mm -hmm. So all this falls out of basically the central slice theorem from the radon transform. So if we have a rubber ducky and we undergo a Fourier transform, which is basically just expressing the image in sine waves, where the lowest resolution features in the center and the highest resolution features on the outside. Another way of thinking of a Fourier transform is if you have an image being formed, it goes through the diffraction plane. That's the Fourier transform of an image. And so in an electron microscope, unlike crystallography, we can reform the image. And so we will get an image um, formed at the imaging plane, whereas you can't, well, they do now. They have Frenzel lenses, but they're not very effective. But you can't reform an image very easily from x-rays. So it's interesting, isn't it? There's a lot of math involved here, but one of the things you talk about in a few more slides is how this math has been really taken out of the issue with us because we have all these sophisticated software tools that make it easy for the rest of us. Exactly, and that's happened a lot in crystallography as well, so that you know you don't have to understand the, the underlying math or be able to do the underlying math to um, uh, use these software packages to get a structure. But if you notice in this Fourier transform of the duct, there is a central line here that matches the other view of the duct. And so that's the central slice there, and that, that there will be a matching um, line through the Fourier transform that addresses the re angular relationship of these two views. And so we can align these orthogonally and then undergo back projection to a duct. Now, you can imagine if you only have two views, there's not a lot of information there, so you won't get a very good-looking duck back. So if you want to get a really good-looking duck back, you need to actually fill that plane in with a lot of different slices. And so you have to take hundreds of thousands to millions of views and undergo this method filling in this volume with multiple different slices to get um, a high-resolution, complete structure. So I guess we should ask the question, how long does it take to acquire one of these images? So right now I'm collecting data. I am sitting in Trevor's office. It's now <laughs> automated, and it does it all by itself. And so I collect about 60 images um, an hour to about 30 images an hour, depending on how the sample behaves. And so these images go um, automatically onto a system that then corrects for motion that we have in our images, and that's what I'm going to talk about next. So. Let's just talk about the reconstruction first, though, because if we think about the computational power required to do this, we realize from the, these first slides that most of this work was done in the 70s, so 71, 72. So a lot of the information to do this was available back in the 70s. But what wasn't available back then was the computational power to do the reconstructions from millions of images. We just didn't have the memory or the disk space to do this. And doing it by hand was just not a possibility. And so when I started my graduate degree and my postdoc, when we, I started doing this, it required a lot of CPUs, hundreds of CPUs. And you needed a high-performance computing cluster to do this, to split your data out over hundreds of processors. Nowadays, computers have gotten so sophisticated and fast that you can actually use the GPUs that you use to power your video games on a high-end workstation with 22 or 40 processors to do a reconstruction in a matter of a week. And in addition, a lot of the software has gotten much, much better because they've gone back and optimized the code, such as System Relying and CryoSpark, where you can now really implement these things in a matter of hours. We have a couple of questions. One is, I can't just retrofit 
an existing transmission electron microscope with a cryo tool, can I? I need to buy a dedicated instrument. There is a few requirements to do cryo, and in fact, I did cryo on your basic um, oh, really? microscope. You just need a special holder, which is a um, uh, basically a nitrogen vacuum flask attached to a rod that cools your specimen in the beam. So if you have a Joel TEM, you can do this. Um, it's much nicer to have a dedicated instrument. Um, I would really consider the instrument we have here, which is a Titan Creos, as nothing more than a data generating machine. So it is built to be automated. It can put 12 samples in at a time and image through those 12 samples over the course of a week. Um, it's a very nice instrument, but it's not necessary to do cryo-EM. It is probably necessary to get to high resolution because it still requires hundreds of thousands of particle images to get to that resolution that we want because if you think about biological molecules, a lot of them are conformationally variable from one another. So if you want to get 100,000 molecules that all look alike, you sometimes have to collect 500,000 images of the molecule. Big data is involved here, isn't it? I can it see is. that. It is. It's a great thing for people because you, you, you get both the physics, the biology, as well as the computational big data sort of introduction. So it's kind of what attracted me to this technology early on was it was really this sort of forefront that was bringing together a lot of things that I liked to do scientifically. Uh, we have a, a question about the fact that a lot of students don't know the uh, Fourier transform process. So can you explain a little bit or uh, they need to know that? A Fourier transform, you do need to know. Um, it's, it's simply a mathematical transformation of sine waves into a plot. It's funny, isn't it? We use Fourier transforms all the time. We just don't know it in our cell phones, in our audio. Everything we use has a Fourier transform somehow attached to it. So it's one of these things we kind of take for granted, but there is some sophisticated math behind it. So I think to answer the question, uh, if you're a high school student listening to this, you don't have to be uh, put off by the fact that it's a Fourier transform. If you need to learn it, you can find out later, but that doesn't stop you understanding what's happening with these images. So this is two Fourier transforms. <laughs> so ice behaves differently than other materials, and this is one of the problems we've had in biological imaging, and that's that when we put an electron beam on water, water is not conductive. And so it tends to want to move away from the electron beam. And so on the left in image A, you have a Fourier transform of amorphous carbon. And you can see that there's a nice set of rings going from low resolution out to high resolution here. And those rings are induced by the CTF of the microscope. And so this is the CTF. That's the contrast transfer function. The easiest way to think about that is when the electron beams refocus back onto itself to form a point, it doesn't meet in the same place depending on where the ray is coming from the electron lens. And that's because the electron lenses that we use are not perfect. And so they basically spread the beam out over a certain distance. And so in my microscope, that's 2.7 millimeters. And so you get an imperfect sort of image out of it. And so this is defocus-induced um, oscillation in bright, dark um, elements within your image. And so if you think about this, what would be white in your image gets flipped to dark, and then back to light again, and then back to dark. Now this is ice, and you can see that pattern is almost completely lost. And the reason is because the ice is moving in response to the electron beam. And so we study this quite extensively. And what we think is happening is the electron beam, when it hits the water, causes the water to basically dome. And so when we look at large viruses, we can actually see them actually rotate a couple of degrees. So in other words, they actually roll. And so we have a researcher here that works on diamonds. And we were able to actually get her diamonds to flow through the water <laughs> as we imaged them because they're moving much more than even biological material would. Yeah. And we say water, but actually it's, it's ice, right? So it's a nominal yes. solid, but these things are moving through this solid water. It, it's 
it's wonderful when you think about the physics, because I worked on a helium microscope, and we used to burn holes in the water that was frozen at uh, 4 degrees Kelvin. Wow. And the hole would seal itself up again after a few minutes, because the water at that low a temperature flows still. And so what we have to do because of this motion is to correct for that movement. And so here you see the virus motion occurring and then taking that and correcting it. So the image on the left, because they're moving, is a little bit blurry mm -hmm. compared to the one on the right, much crisper. Is, yeah. that, is that what we're taking away from Exactly. This? And so how do we do that? And that's really the technology that's come about. So this is the um, direct electron detectors. And so we, we typically have used CCD cameras, which are charge-coupled devices. In the olden days, charge-coupled devices was, were state-of-the-art. And they are still probably the best camera for light. But the, the complementary metal oxide um, semiconductors that are active pixels are much, much better for electron detection because they have high-speed readout capability. And they could go directly into the electron beam. The third thing that really made the difference was that they were able to spin the back substrate on these um, CMOS chips. And so CMOS chips are all the CPUs in the world, all the memory chips in the world. They're all CMOS chips. And now, of course, they're the cameras in our cell phones, aren't they? And we get very good images with those cameras. And we can do 1080, 60 frames a second with a cell phone camera, which is absolutely astounding. That's really what underlies this technology developed in the electron microscope, these high-speed readouts. So two things that we get from the CMOS chip that's been back then, an improved DQE at low frequencies. DQE? So that is detector quantum efficiency. In other words, each electron is a quanta, and the detector is the CMOS chip, and we're measuring the efficiency of every electron hitting that chip being counted. So if you think about it, not every electron necessarily can be detected by the CMOS chip. So now we're getting very high efficiency in detection. So ideally it would be what, one? And one. One would be I, the perfect. And so we are near one at low frequencies on uh, CMOS chip. And so what is why low frequencies? Well, most of what you think about as biological molecules are in the range of 100 nanometers to 10 nanometers, really, that, that globular structure. And those low frequencies allow us to see it. And what I like to say is we like to see flowers in a field because all those flowers are the same shape and size, and that's mm -hmm. what proteins look like when they're in ice, when they have really good low-frequency information transfer to the camera. The next thing is the high-speed readout. So we get 50 frames a second, usually, on our um, microscopes. And what that allows us to do is to correct for that beam-induced motion. So we take each of those individual frames and align them to each other to restore the high-resolution information. And the other thing we can do now is specific dose selection. So at the beginning, I said we needed 10 to 30 electrons to have high-resolution information preserved in our images. Now we can actually decide the best frames that have that dose and select just those frames from a much larger movie that may have 100 electrons frames per squared total dose in it so we can really see the molecule quite well, so we can look, identify them. So we can select the best images that you need. For Absolutely, yes. <clears throat> and so this is a plot of the DQE of the current standard um, CMOS camera, which is uh, produced by a company called Gatan. It's the K2 Summit. And so there's two things that this camera can do that are quite unique. One is it can go into counting mode, so it can count each electron event. But it requires you to have a very low flux of electrons, or very few electrons per second. So if you think about a rainstorm, when it's raining very lightly and there's a puddle, you can see each individual raindrop in that puddle. But when it really starts to pour, you can't tell where the individual events occur. So what we have to do is have a very light rain of electrons on our specimen. But what that does is put us way up here at low frequencies. So what are we plotting here, Dwight? This is your quantum efficiency. So ideally, we'd like it to be as close to one as possible yeah. up there. But uh, where are we with the older instruments? So the old CCDs were down here. And then you can see at high frequencies, they really suffered. Whereas the latest generation of um, CMOS cameras are actually quite good at high frequencies. And what you can see on this red line is it goes beyond this 
factor called the Nyquist frequency. So the Nyquist frequency is that um, basically you need two pixels to resolve any feature. And so that's the Nyquist limit. So whatever the resolution of your um, system is, it requires a two pixel limit to get to that resolution. So if one pixel has a two angstrom resolution or size to it in real space, your Nyquist resolution limit would be four angstrom. But because we could do a centroid localization of the electron event on these chips, we can now push past the Nyquist limit. This sounds like we're defying fundamental laws, but uh, we're not, are we? This is all no, it's exactly the same as super-resolution light microscopy, where in theory you should be limited to half the wavelength of the light that you're using to do your imaging. But now with these centroid functions, we can further um, localize the event that we're looking for to so the fluorescence of, say, a green fluorescent protein that we're using to mark our favorite molecule. And so this is basically how the movie correction works. I'm not going to show you the movies because in order to show them on the webinar, they reduce the resolution so much it's not worth it. But you can see in this movie file, you can't, this is an individual frame. You could barely see any um, particles in that frame. But now when we sum it all up, they're, they're a little bit better. But you can see from the Fourier transform that you have a, a loss of information in this direction. That's because when we put the electron beam on, everything kind of moved this way. Because right, you expect it to, to have rings like uh, you know. Yes. So just like in the carbon, we had rings all the way around. So when we correct it, one, you can see the particles are much easier to see now. And our Fourier transform is restored so that we have rings in all directions out to very high resolution. So if you think about that, we have multiple frames, and we know what the dose is per frame. And so now we know, based on experiments done over the past 10 years, what resolution is going to be available to us of the molecule based on how many electrons have passed through it. And so now we could take that movie and just take the first four frames and be able to preserve the two ancient information. But we can use all that to, one, pick the particles and align them and get them in a fairly good registration, and then slowly remove the material that is burnt until we're left with only the very high resolution information in the reconstruction. And we do one last step to help further improve the resolution, and that's to do what's called particle polishing. So if we think about it, not every molecule is going to be moving in the same direction. So we have Basically, the beginning, which is a red dot, and then, well, actually, you know, a green dot, and then and a white line showing the vector to the red dot, the finishing location. And you can see some images are better than others, but what you'll notice if you look at these images, they're not all moving in the same direction, ultimately. And so we can then further refine the position of the particle and improve the resolution even better. And that's what's really been getting us down to atomic resolution, is this final particle polishing step. But this particle polishing is done by hand? No, this is all done computationally. And so each one of these particles will have been windowed out. And so we've initially probably gone through the alignment with all the dose, say 100 electrons per angstrom squared, stepped it back to higher and higher resolution, so cutting off those in frames that have, been, have less information in them. And then finally, at the end, we take the particle and excise it from the aligned stack, movie stack. And then only the frames we're interested in align that particle within each of those movie stacks. Oh, I see. Oh. And that's how you acquire that final high-resolution <laughs> image in what looks like a single molecule, but really it's been captured from all of these reconstructions that you're doing. And so now you understand why this is so computationally intensive. Absolutely. And, yeah. But what we're doing today is incredible. So in the last three weeks, just in Nature um, Publishing alone, we have one, two, three, four, five high-resolution structures. So the trip v 6 the trip v 5 ATP synthase, the yeast exocyst, and now we have a prion filament by electron diffraction at 0 0.78 angstrom's resolution. So, Dwight, I've heard of yeast, and I know prions are the things that coat your brain when you have 
Parkinson's or something? Like, what are these? So prions are from a uh, Jacob Hortzfeld disease oh, yeah. or uh, um, mad cow, mad cow or scrapies. Um, so these are these um, small molecules that won the Nobel Prize, I don't know, about 15 years ago? Okay. And then even back again, another when, of course, well, Jacob was discovered 30 years ago. Um, so these small molecules, if you eat the brains of, uh, say, sh a sheep or a cow, or a human, in the case of new, the New Guinea tribe that got quite the foul Jacob disease, um, you'll digest these prion proteins that are um, in a different fold state, and you'll develop the disease. So it took a long time for people to believe that a protein could be infectious. And so for sheep, they'll rub against a post and they can spread the scrapies disease in that way. Uh, Dwight, uh, can you explain to us uh, uh, why they succeed to go to 0 0.7 on film? It seems amazing. Um, well, it was a, it, it's, it's an amazing um, achievement, really is. Um, because they're looking at electron diffraction, mm -hmm. they're able to get to a little bit higher resolution. Um, so this was on an aberration effect in microscope. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, now I know why Akakia yeah. was mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. You're, literally, these are all the last few weeks, 2018. So I can see why. This, this is, is all so this exciting. month, yes, in one journal. So we, we can begin to understand just how transformative this is going to be. So building up the biological assembly is going to require us actually imaging more than just single molecules. And so I want Trevor to play movie three for us. And so these are some older tomograms that I did with a person who's an amazing biologist at the University of Pennsylvania, Tatiana Slavinik. Um, she does just work that I consider more art than anything, because what she's done here is cracked open a cell to and preserve the materials that she's interested in within that cell. So this is a leading edge of an epithelial cell that's undergoing endocytosis. And what you can see here at the very top is a clathrin-coated budding vesicle. So that's the round thing in the top left hand. Yeah, that has a sort of cage pattern to it. And you can see another one just up to the right of it forming in another patch just off to the side. But in addition, you'll see a whole bunch of black dots next to it. That's an actin and a actinomyosin complex that's there to help bud that pinch that butt off from the plasma membrane. And you can actually see little tiny dark spots off these large strands, which are the microtubules. Those are motor proteins staged there to capture that clathrin budded vesicle to bring it to wherever it's got to go in the cell. So I can see why you're saying this is more an art because of the effort involved in making something like this. You were explaining to me earlier that this is actually coated with a heavy metal like tungsten or palladium? Exactly. So we're not actually looking at the biological molecules here. We're actually looking at um, heavy metals that have coated the biological structures. And more importantly, we removed all the other cytoplasmic components that would otherwise be in the way. So you have to work out the biochemistry and the cell biology in order to crack a cell open and preserve all these structures by fixation to get this image. So Dwight, would it be fair to say this was the state of the art before the cryo TM came along? Indeed. In fact, this I mean it really is art. It, there are only a few people in the world I've ever met that can do this quality of work. And so let's go to the tomogram. So we've done these tilt images, and now we can back project them into a three-dimensional volume, which is movie four. And we can slice through it just like we would a uh, um, CAT scan or an MRI that you would get in the hospital, and now localize each of the individual components. In addition, we can present this even as a three-dimensional volume. But what you're going to notice when we step through this is that you're really only imaging the dark material. You don't see the internal structure, and the reason you don't see it is because it's just coated with heavy atoms, and all the electron diffraction is induced by the um, heavy metal. So by having the metal on there, it limits what we can actually do with these images. Exactly. And that's why we want to do this on vitreous material. And uh, there is some uh, deterioration of the sample with this coating? There's obviously going to be dehydration artifacts. But more importantly, we don't, we, we don't even worry about those because we're at so low resolution. We're literally looking just at the heavy atoms on the surface of the biological molecules, which we are assuming are probably no longer there. Let's go to the next slide. 
And that should be a movie as well. Now this is going to show us the... So this is a cryogenic slice through the leading edge of a HeLa cell that comes out of a group in uh, um, Martin's Reed. And the young woman who did, did this is now at the Embo Lab. And so this is a nucleus at the bottom right and the nuclear envelope in that streak in the middle. And you'll see a whole bunch of biological entities out there in the cytoplasm, microtubules, ribosomes, um, actin, and intermediate filaments, different vesicular bodies. And so what she's going to do now is she's going to go through and segment and identify each of those components for you. So there's the nuclear pore complexes in the membrane, the ribosomes, different membrane components, the microtubules. And then we're going to see the actin and the intermediate filaments pop in. And then lastly, the chromatin. And now we removed the, the imaging, and now we have a map of all the different components within the cell that we can identify. And so, do I, in contrast to the previous image, here there's no metal coating, and this sample is actually frozen in its natural liquid state. Indeed. And so we've actually found a so spot in the cell where we've used... Uh, an ion beam or a laser to basically blade away the surface to get thin enough of the electron beam to go through. And now we're imaging really material that is diffracting the um, electrons based on the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen that are the bio biological molecules. So what we're seeing is the true biological material. In the past, you've talked about this being a sort of biological atlas. Now you can see all the different components within that biological Exactly. So this is really where we're going to in the future, and this is where we're going to have the biggest challenge of technology in the future. So let's go to the next slide. And so this is basically a, a neural junction, so a synapse. And this is from a paper from 2014 describing sort of the challenge of the future. So here we have a synapse in a neuron that basically has all these different components, and we have to go in and identify what our favorite molecule or molecule of interest is, or possibly what the biological changes are due to some sort of pharmacokinetic um, compound that we've doped into this um, uh, neuron. And so we have to basically go through and segment out all these molecules and match the template of known molecules to those images. And so this is really where we're headed to in the future, and there's a lot of push now to figure out how we're going to do that. You know, do we need low resolution frequencies or do we need high resolution frequencies? Mm -hmm. A lot of push now that the high resolution information helps us deconvolve the, the fact we have a bunch of molecules on top of one another, touching one another. So I was a geneticist for a long time, and one of my favorite People, uh, Susan Forsberg used to tell me that everything in the cell is connected. And so when you're doing genetics, you're just finding out one of the connections. And so one of the great things about being able to do this is actually being able to see those connections. As a geneticist, I use screens and other things to try and deduce why a protein might be interacting with this component or another component. We could take the two genes and one mutated or the other mutated and then see how that interaction would occur. Here we're going to actually physically look at the interaction between biomolecules, which is just astounding to me. It's almost Star Trekian. It does sound it. So maybe a good chance to address some questions. Someone's asking, has anyone ever looked at molecular self-assembly processes on the nanoscale? Um, yes, they have. Yeah. Um, so the classic one that we're doing all the time and has been very popular is the ribosome. So we've been watching the ribosome basically assemble polypeptides. And so they've undergone a, a huge revolution in the ribosome world. Um, uh, they, they got the crystal structure of the ribosome, but a lot of the dynamic work has been done at high resolution now in cryo-TEM. Um, we've also been looking at um, gold particles <laughs> um, assembling, but that, that's actually a liquid now. So that's another big push is to basically look at things assembling in liquids. And so I worked with a guy named Chaim Baum at the University of Pennsylvania who had a very cool... Um, liquid cell, and so other people are using graphene to trap water um, between two layers and then imaging the dynamics of the chemistry in, in, in between those two layers. Oh, yeah, so uh, another question by email. What is the cost of one of these Titan systems, and what, what special facilities are needed? Uh, yeah, I'm not allowed to say what we paid for ours because <laughs> we got a good deal, 
But um, typically speaking, it depends on the bells and whistles, but you're looking in, in the millions and millions of range. The um, current price for a direct electron detector is half a million dollars. And that's come down about 300000 And in the high-end uh, Titan Creos instrument, usually runs you between four and eight million, depending on how many different things you have on it. CS correctors are expensive. They're about a million apiece. Um, the auto load is about a million dollars. Yeah, it is a big wow. And this is why it's quite amazing that so many universities have begun investing in this technology. But that just tells you the belief in the power of what is coming with the ability to look at whole cells. So what is the future? Well, it's really about how do we preserve the material? Because if you think about 500 microns is enough for a few cells, but it's not going to get you, say, a, a whole muscle tissue frozen. And so how do we go about imaging biologically relevant structures? If you think about the brain, the brain is the, the big challenge. Uh, how do we go about imaging the brain and synapse formation? And I think that's really the, the next big organ for biologists to begin to understand. And there's going to be a a revolution in knowledge about the brain because of all the different um, optico-genetic stuff that we've now developed in the CRISPR-Cas9 system so we can do the transformation in recalcitrant cell lines that we couldn't do anything in before. And so how do we image these tissues as well? Because we only image through you know, a very small portion of the cell. We can't image through 50 microns. We can only image through a couple hundred nanometers at best. And so will we develop new imaging modalities? using scanning transmission electron microscopy so we can see microns of thickness? Or do we figure out new ways to, to thin the cells in a way that we can then step through um, these volumes in a, in a reasonable way? And the other thing we're going to know is for DTM, you know, conformational dynamics. You think about enzymes, they're not just sitting there in solution as a rigid, hard structure like a, a, a glass of water. They're these floppy, very dynamic things that go around and capture molecules and then convert them to something else. So the fourth dimension here is time. You want to see exactly. how Exactly. We, we want to know about the dynamics, so the conformational time changes as a molecule is doing what it does. So like a motor protein walks. And so we want to know that cycle of, of hydrolysis along the microtubule. Ribosomes assemble peptides, and we want to know how that happens. You know, all these polymerases that create DNA and transcribe RNA and underlie a lot of diseases like such as cancer or um, loss of information from the genome. And so finally, can we discern molecules that are connected or layered upon each other within these volumes? And that's going to be a, a large computational challenge that a lot of people are beginning to move towards. And why if I have a question when I heard you and this beautiful work, uh, the limitation is the sample. That's true with everything <laughs> in science. Your limitation is always with what you begin with. And I, you know, in biology, we have to understand that so much work can be done in one organism and then be completely eclipsed because someone found a wonderful model organism in some tidal pool somewhere that does it so much more easily to understand. Yes. And so it, it's always discovering the sample that allows you to get the information you're looking for. So that's why I always tell young scientists, it's more important to have a good question so that you can find a good sample than it is to bang your head against the desk trying to get that sample to work. <laughs> Thank you. So do we have one more slide? Let me see. I think we're done. I think we're done. Very good. So uh, I don't know how much time we have, maybe just a few minutes. Maybe people will be interested in asking some questions. Fascinating, fascinating webinar. Trevor, White, uh, Kalia, thank you so much. I can see why this is really why so many people are getting excited about how this is going to revolutionize so many different fields. And I think there's going to be just a whole new understanding of how biology works that is going to really revolutionize um, the world. And you know, it's, it's going to be scary because we have to come to terms with a lot of questions in the future. You know. What if we can grow organisms to transport us so we don't have to use fossil fuels anymore? You know, what if we can make things out of biological things or biological entities? You know? Yeah, you mentioned synthetic biology, sort of artificial life, and yes. all these kinds of questions. Yeah, it's going to be a fascinating, fascinating subject. Well, Mike, I'm not sure if you have any. Well, thank you. We yes. can certainly think about wrapping up. I do.
I do, Trevor. First of all, I wanted to thank both yourself and Katya and Dwight today. You're right. It really, it's a fascinating field. I, I like Dwight's comment in the beginning that said, you know, when people started thinking about freezing samples in the beginning, they ran away in horror and, and things have changed quite a bit. Also struck me was the imaging ability, the visualizations. I think, Dwight, you're right. That helps change people's perception and what they can know and do in the biological sciences. So it's really pretty cool. So thank you again. Uh, folks are right at a perfect timing. I, what I'm going to do now is make a brief announcement and then I'll ask you to put up a, uh, a uh, I'm gonna put up a survey and ask you just to take a moment answering a couple of questions about that survey. But before we do, I would like to invite all of you to join us in our upcoming webinar series. So both NCI Southwest and nanoforme.org support this webinar, and they'll talk about the webinars. You can see the recordings, the past archived webinars, and the upcoming webinars on either of these sites. And because you registered for this one, we'll make sure that you know about the opportunity for the upcoming webinars. So here's the final slide that's coming up. And please, folks, uh, the survey that's going to appear on your screen in just a moment. And there it is. So if you just take a moment, if there are just four questions, go ahead and click those box and hit submit at the end. So thank you again, Dwight, Katya, Trevor. Thank you for being with us today. That officially concludes our webinar. If you just close your uh, or turn your microphone on to mute, we'll leave the survey up for a few minutes to let people complete it. Thank you again. That officially ends our webinar for today.